Okay, I've begun recording. Okay, going live on Facebook. just happened here. A little delay here. Okay. live on Facebook. Okay. I'm going to use the short title, Astronomy on Vacation, for the title on Facebook. Fine by me. The description will have everything. I could care less. Okay. Okay, Mary, I've tied this video to the event that you created. Okay. On live. I can begin. Okay. Nope. Oh, hold on. It's loading. Okay, three, two, one. And I think we're live. Okay. Let me check. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. Oh, and we're live. Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome once again to Amateur Astronomers Incorporated, also known as AAI, for our weekly Fridays at Home presentations. AAI makes its home at William Miller Sperry Observatory on the campus of Union County College in Cranford, New Jersey. But since the observatory is closed at this time, we're holding our weekly presentations online like this. Our presenter this evening is AAI member Aaron Zuckerman. Aaron's been a member for many years at AAI. He's a QO, which means he can operate the 24-inch telescope at Sperry Observatory. He's also our current president, and has given presentations at Sperry numerous times. So the title of his presentation is Astronomy on Vacation, How Not to Ruin Your Vacation Yet Still Get the Great Views. So with that, Aaron, please begin. Thanks, Mayor. So we've all been there, right? You're on vacation. It's, you come back to the hotel room. You're just about to go in for the night and you happen to take a look out your balcony and it's perfectly clear. And you have that sunken feeling of, okay, do I go out to the pool and look up at the night sky or do I get to bed because I have to be up at eight o'clock in the morning because we have a reservation for God does what? So we're gonna to talk tonight about how to balance those two things, how to plan a vacation with both of those things in mind to varying degrees. We'll go through a couple of mine uh, recent ones that, you know, just to give some live examples. So, you know, we have vacation. Now we have vacation in astronomy. Can't go without a telescope. First thing you have to do is you have to manage expectations. You can't have both of these, right? You can either have, you know, 
you can't have them at the same time. You can't have fireworks in Cinderella's castle and the Milky Way over a lake. But you're just not gonna find that in one place. So what you need to do is you just need to find a balance of what you want to do. How much vacation, how much astronomy, those two things can vary. I've gone on vacations where I've done no astronomy. I've come down on astronomy trips where I've done almost no vacation. You balance. And one of the things you have to balance is, what are you actually going to be able to do? Here's Tokyo. Plenty to do in Tokyo. Great place for a vacation. Can't see a thing. This is Montana. Great views. Not a lot of clouds, very great big horizons, nothing in your way, also nothing to do. All right, so what are you gonna do during the day? There are some places that actually, some of you may already go that aren't bad compromises. And the one I went to last year, which we'll start to talk about is Southern Florida. Yes, the bastion of civilization that is Southern Florida. So what does Southern Florida have that's unique almost about a balance between a vacation and an astronomy trip. Well, ancient mangrove forest, an hour from Miami Beach. You can stay in Miami, outside Miami, halfway in between, drive to the beach, drive to the Everglades. You can do both in the same day, beach in the morning, Everglades in the afternoon or vice versa. And it's not just those two things. You'd be amazed to know that there's actually a winery down there. I didn't go, I can't comment on how good it is, but it's, it was definitely, a, there's definitely a winery there. They do tours, you can, you can even stay there. So if you want that winery experience, you can still do that. I don't know, there, there's definitely not mountains and trees, but if you like palm trees, I guess you're in a good place. One hidden gem that I found that wasn't even on the travel guides is it's called the Fruit and Spice Park. I just stumbled upon it. It's in Homestead, Florida, which is halfway between Miami and the Everglades. And it's this wonderful little private, couple acres, nothing crazy, of nothing but fruit trees. And you pay your admission fee and you get to eat whatever's fallen. And they have everything. I like mangoes. I just happened to get there when they were setting up for their mango festival and they have a lot of mangoes. Now we'll just take a divergence here just to tell you what I mean by a lot this way forever in Southern Florida. Each one of these plates with a tag in front of it is going to be a different variety that comes from a different kind of tree. So totally different varieties, just like apples and they're all mangoes. So here we go. Still going, still going, still going. Almost there, almost there. Up, oh, up, oh, we're reaching the end. Up, oh, there, is that it? Up, oh, yeah, nope, I lied. There's more. And that's it. And as you can see from the video, they actually hadn't finished setting up yet. There were more plates to come. Um, I think they said something like 250 different varieties that they grow there. Fantastic place. So that's enough about the vacation part, but what about the astronomy part? Well, that's the astronomy part. That's a photo. I took a single photo from the Everglades. I had been in contact with the local astronomy club before I went down. I got advice on where to go. I didn't take it. I instead asked the park ranger at the Everglades, where do you go? She pointed to a place on the map and that's where I went. And I was not disappointed. So this is just on a boardwalk over the swamp, single shot with an old camera and a not great lens, slightly different view. And this is about what it looked like. And because you're so much further south, 
everything in the sky is so much further and farther north. Right? I got to see the uh, Globula Cluster Omega Centauri, which you just can't miss. When you're out there at night, you're like, uh, I'm not quite sure. Oh, nope, nope, that's where it is. That's, that's it. Can't miss that. Couldn't miss it if you tried. So where is everything in proximity here? So the mangrove forest is number one. Miami Beach is number two. The winery is number three. The fruit and spice parks, number four. And where I took the photo is at number five. From here to here is an hour and 20 minutes, depending on traffic. So all very much doable. Did I mention the dolphins? <laughs> right? It's There's basically everything. What's great about this is the dolphins uh, swim up the river into the Everglades into the mangrove forests because it's really, really shallow. They teach their the young dolphins how to fish there. So they're within a couple of feet of the surface because the there's only six feet of water to begin with. So they're there, you can see them. They do dolphin washing to watching tours that you always get great views. They jump out, highly recommended. Now, not everybody wants to do their own vacation. I totally see the appeal of a pre-planned vacation. And there are travel agents and companies and services that specialize on astronomy-based vacation plans and itineraries. Mary, Mary and Kathy went on one a couple years ago for the Northern Lights up to Norway. They had a fantastic time. Here's one I found where you take a cruise ship up the north coast of Norway, and that's what you get. Now, be warned, this is the ship that they take you on. Notice the number of lights. There is, unfortunately, a pesky international maritime law that says ships have to have running lights at all times. Now, normally a cruise ship, right, if you just book a cruise, looks like that. It's a Roman candle. You, and that it's like that all night. You can be up there at 2 a.m. All those lights are still on. And it just washes everything out. You can't get far enough forward. You can't get far enough back on the ship to actually be away from the, from the light pollution. Believe me, I've tried. Uh, one time I was on a cruise. We actually happened to be cruising down at night in a pack of other cruise ships. This is what they look like from sea. That's the moon. And that's the cruise ship that's almost as bright. And that wasn't close. That was, that was far away, right? That's taken from the side of the ship with a long telephoto lens. That ship was a few miles away, and that's how bright it is. Now, if you do want to, again, that balance, you can take the astronomy cruise that's just about going out for astronomy and the Northern Lights. But you're going to go to Norway. If you want to go to the Bahamas, there's no really astronomy cruises that go to the Bahamas, but there's a book. So from our friends at Springer Publishing, uh, part of the Patrick Moore Practical Astronomy series, this is digital only at the moment. I think it's 30 bucks. I have not read it. It has mixed reviews. Um, I can't say I promote it one way or the other. I can just tell you how it is. It cruise ship astronomy for and astrophotography. It, you know, the introduction tells you, it teaches you and shows you how to compromise on a cruise ship. Now you will see other cruises advertise photos like this. That's not a real photo. That's been doctored. Now, whether they actually get to run, as you can see, no lights. I have heard of cruise companies who will work with a local Coast Guard and prearrange where they're gonna stop at night, in advance, stay still, drop anchor, have the lights off, have the radio beacons on so they can still be, you know, they're on radar and they're in communication with all the nearby ships, but it's not a common thing. But this company has, you know, several packages. I'm not promoting, I'm not advertising. I just want you to see what, what ranges you can get. So they, it, everything from a $350 four night cruise to the Caribbean, which they have a couple dedicated nights you know, astronomy nights out to sea, all the way to a 53-day Mediterranean Grand and Grand Asian adventure where you go from Tokyo to Venice. 
53 nights, you're going to get a clear night. Four nights, eh, it's the Bahamas, who knows? So again, and there's of course packages all the way through. Again, not an advertisement. The one caveat to this, to ships not being ideal for astronomy, are sailing ships. And I mean sailing ships, not sail boats, like a big tall ship. These are the rights, these are the lights they run, right? This ship actually does do cruises, and these are the lights they run at night. That's it. It's not even an astronomy-based cruise. It's just a sailing ship, and you actually have to work. You pay them to work. Sounds wonderful. And what's nice about a sailing ship, besides the lack of lights, is the places to go. So the blue circles, I'll just run through them quickly. If you stand here, all you see is bow. There's nothing. There's the bowsprit, and then there's sea. So if these sails aren't set, which at night they probably won't be, you have an unobstructed view out the front of the ship. On a cruise ship or any other real commercial ship, you are not going to get near the front. This isn't, you know, you're not Leonardo DiCaprio in, in Titanic. You're not going to be holding somebody over the front of the ship. Same thing back here at the stern, right? No matter what you do, there's never a sail in front of you out to the stern. So you're good to go there. You can even climb, especially on ships that you work, there are little platforms, one here, there's one here, but I don't recommend this one, and one here. You can sit on them, perfectly stable. You're tied down, you're, you're roped off with mountain climbing, mountain climbing gear. This one has an, a great view forward. This one has an excellent view to the back, as long as the spanker isn't in the way. Another place that you possibly can go, but I don't recommend just for obvious reasons, are up here on the higher masts. So you can actually sit on them. They're more than strong enough for you to sit on them, people do. So if you can get up here and just look out the front of the ship, you're up in the sky, the lights are down here, there's sails in the way, you're above that continuous layer of humidity that sort of sits on the ocean, on the ocean surface at night, and you're out in the middle of nowhere. And when I may say the middle of nowhere, I mean these ships really do go to the middle of nowhere. All right, so it's called the Bark Europa, and this is a, a trip that they had planned for this year that they actually did do from April 18th to July 25th. They sailed from Chile to Australia. So you leave Chile, you just land in Australia, you're crossing the Pacific the entire time. That would be a much better way to spend COVID than what I actually ended up doing. You just have to work. But, you know, at that point, by the time you're over 90 days at sea, you're, you're going to be more than comfortable climbing up any bit of that ship. There's also land tours, of course. Here's another company that just offers land tours. Again, not advertising. All right, here's a 19-day trip to Africa, and here's a four-day trip with a glass igloo, which sounds wonderful, up to Lapland for the, the Aurora. These trips will vary in, how, in their balance of daytime activity and nighttime activity. But what you do get, which is nice with a tour like this, is they know you're going to be doing stuff at night and they don't plan anything for eight o'clock in the morning. You can book your regular land tour. Here just happens to be one I found for Yosemite, right? Where you spend eight days out in the park camping and what have you. They don't have it planned for you to be as quite dedicated to the astronomy portion as you could be. So you just have to balance it. Again, it's all about how much do you want to do astronomy or vacation while you're out. And of course, you can always plan yourself. And that's what we're actually about to go do. So you have to compromise with absolutely everything. First thing you want to take a look at is the moon phase, right? You would ideally, unless you want to observe the moon, go during new moon. Is that when your vacation's for? Maybe not. That's not such a bad thing, right? Since I didn't plan my trip to Florida around astronomy, it just sort of happened. I worked the moon into my experience where I waited for moonrise 
and I shot it. Gives a little more dramatic feel. You know, you can see the stars sort of twinkle and then sun and then moonrise, which looks like sunrise. If I told you it was sunrise, you would have believed me. Coming across the water, you can make the best out of it. You also want to plan depending on whether you're a night owl or an early bird. Because depending on what phase the moon is in, it might come up in the evening, but be gone by morning. So if you're okay getting up at 3 a.m., then you can plan your trip that way. And you can actually plan to just go to bed early, get up at 3 a.m., go do your observing, and then grab a lot of coffee. Or if you're a night owl, like I think most of us are, if you can arrange it so that the moon doesn't come up till late or sets early, then you just stay up late and don't do anything in the morning. You also want to look at light pollution, light pollution, light pollution, light pollution, light pollution. Right? You can. It is much better to be somewhere where the observe where the seeing conditions aren't very good, but it's dark, than some place where you have beautiful horizons and the air is nice and clear, but there's light pollution. So. You can use maps like this. And you just Google light pollution and, and maps come up. This is actually a fully integrated Google map. You type in the address, it tells you, it shows you the brightness levels go from white, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, gray, black, with these black zones being the darkest sites. So this is Big Bend National Park down in the south of Texas. This is the middle of nowhere. Um, most of this is military base. And not every place is going to be is going to be suitable, right? You may say, "Oh, I'm doing a trip to Europe. I'll just I'll just do some observing while I'm in Europe." There are no dark places in Europe left. There, there, there's just none. I mean, unless you're going to Eastern Europe, in which case you have some uh, Belarus. I think this is. There's some dark spots. Even the coast of Norway, you know, you're going to be out there, and it's going to be kind of right out. There's going to be light pollution. You can't help it. Place that maybe not so bad is North Africa. All right, if you work a Mediterranean tour in, stay here, drive a little bit out, right? Because remember, you're looking south. So light pollution to the north doesn't matter. Everything you're going to look at is basically south. So if you, you're just on the edge here, right, you're on the south side of a city, Go to get a couple miles out, you're in the desert, look south, it'll be fantastic. Back to Florida. This is what Southern Florida looks like. It's just insane, right? This could only happen in Florida. Here are the Everglades, right? This part here. This is Big Cypress National Preserve, which is just an extension of the Everglades, but not a national park. And be careful the advice you get. I highly recommend that you contact the local astronomy club anywhere you're going and get their advice. The advice I got wasn't great. They said to go here. There's a little pull off by a, on some private property right over here-ish, I think it was over here, off this highway. I was like, no, 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 no. Right, I'm gonna be looking in the Southeast. Miami's to the Southeast. Like, no, 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 no. Like, south, southwest, you know, is very good, but no, 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 no. So I asked the park ranger, and where that picture was taken from was about here, right where that really laser pointer is. All right, north and east, useless. But south, it's just Florida Bay. I mean, you get a little bit of Key Largo, but it's mostly just Florida Bay. So you can still, you know, just use the light pollution map and you'll actually be able to find great places to go. Now, you're going, what do you bring? Obviously you don't bring this, right? Clearly you don't bring, you know, a 50 inch Dobsonian. That's probably, I mean, unless you go to the West Texas Star Party, in which case that would be perfectly normal. And, you know, if you're doing astrophotography, keep it simple. Right? Keep it really simple. This is what I recommend. A camera, a lens, a wide angle lens, and a tripod. That's all you need. The shots you saw from Florida were a camera, a lens, and a tripod. And it wasn't a very good camera, and it wasn't a very good lens, and it wasn't a very good tripod. 
and you still get good results because it's dark. If you want to be a little bit more, I'm going to say adventurous and, you know, get more into the photography side of being out there observing, you know, make something productive out of your observing trip. Not that observing itself isn't productive, but you want to track the sky. This is called the Polari by Vixen. Highly rec I personally highly recommend it. It's this big, right? Fits in a backpack, holds like five pounds worth of gear and tracks the sky wonderfully with even a medium telephoto lens. Takes up no room, weighs nothing, runs on double A's, right? So you can always just throw batteries in, not that you ever need to change them. Highly, highly recommend if you wanna just have that little bit extra of an option, right? You're probably gonna have a camera anyway, right? A travel tripod, which this is not, but a travel tripod doesn't take up that much extra space in your carry-on bag or, your, or your, even your luggage bag. And it's certainly easy enough to keep when you, as you're going around with you. As far as actual observing gear, but uh, binoculars, right? That's just, just binoculars, right? If you have a travel scope and you want to bring it, you know, if you want to, if you have a quest star and you want to bring it, if you have a small refractor with a tabletop mount and you want to bring it, fantastic. Go ahead. Just know what you're getting into. You know, if you're, if this is the first few times that you're going and you're, you know, you're excited about what you're, the astronomy you're going to do on vacation, I recommend take whatever you're going to bring, what you think you want to bring, put it on a table and then take half of it because you will always try to pack too much and it never works out well. As far as binocular recommendations, these are Canon binoculars, they're not necessarily astronomy designed, but they're compact and they're image stabilized. That means you hit this button and there are optics and motors inside that steady the rocking of your hands. Provides an excellent platform for you to just view comfortably. These, my favorite pair of binoculars probably ever, they're, they're like 2.1 power and 42 mil across. You're like 2.1 power, what the hell? What's the point of 2.1 power? It's basically like naked eye viewing. Yes, it's basically like naked eye viewing, but with eyes this big. From a reasonably dark sky site, objects that you were, eh, is there something there? Is there not something there, naked eye? You're like, nope, nope, M16, can't miss it. There it is. Yep. Definitely there. And from a really dark sky site, cat skills, that sort of thing, you know, buried deep in the cat skills or, you know, a blue zone, a gray zone, you'll just love them. And they're, as you can see, they're small, they're compact. They don't take up any, they don't take up any space. They're not expensive as binoculars go. And they're great. What not to bring? Are these. This is a pair of Zeiss travel binoculars. They are absolutely fantastic for what they're designed for. What they're designed for is on a hike, you want to go look at something. So they're light, they're compact, but they're tiny and they're high magnification. What does that mean? They're dim. Wonderful for wonderful, wonderful, wonderful for daytime, useless at night. These are a pair of $3,500 Swarovski birding binoculars. And you heard that price correctly. Useless, All right? They're too high power. They're, the, the apertures are too small. They don't really gather that much more light versus the magnification. So, so things are bigger, but they're not necessarily that much brighter. These, with these massive openings, are the same power as these. So you can imagine everything's, every little bright object is just that tiny bit, you know, tiny bit smaller, but significantly brighter. And it's not about big when you're using binoculars for astronomy, it's about bright. Because you're never gonna, I mean, they're tiny. These objects are always tiny. Any of the big diffuse stuff, you're never gonna see with binoculars anyway. So you want to make things bright. That's what I recommend you. That's what I recommend that you bring, and that's it. Especially if you're just starting off. 
let's plan one, right? I will take you through my thought process for my last trip, which was the end of August. So what did I want to do? Camping. I want to go camping. That was okay. So that we're just going to go camping. It was, it's cheap. It's fun. There's s'mores. I highly recommend the s'mores. That was the decision. When? That's when I could take off. Those were the days that I could arrange my schedule to have off from the 13th. You know, so I leave early on the 13th. I could get back sort of late on Sunday afternoon and not worry about it too much. So I was stuck. Those were the dates I had. I was stuck. I had to make the best out of them. Where did I go? Ausable, New York. It's up on Lake Champlain. It's all the way up there. It's north east of the Adirondack State Park. That's where, this is why. This is Ausable Chasm, right? You can see they let you climb along the lock face. Unfortunately, they don't let you do that during COVID, right? But there's this great gorge that they let, they, they let you walk through and you walk along on top and then you can spend as much time as you want. For scale, this is a person. Notice what I haven't said yet. I have not mentioned astronomy once. For me personally, this was a vacation where some astronomy might happen. It would be great if it did. I wouldn't mind if it didn't. But I checked anyway. So that red star is where I stayed. This is the light pollution map. And as you can see, not bad, not great. This is Burlington, Vermont. Here's the gray zone in the Adirondacks. Okay, reasonably dark from where I am. I'm on a lake. Being, over, being next to water, especially just north of water, is fantastic. Moon phase was better than I expected for just being random. It's like, okay, there's, there's something in this. I was getting closer, it was getting closer and closer and closer, and the weather forecast kept getting better and better and better and better and better. From like two weeks out, it said rain, to like three days before, it said clear all three nights. So three nights before the trip, I'm like, oh, come on. I can't just not. Like, that would just be ridiculous. So like, okay, where am I going to observe from? Where I was camping or va vaguely near it was an obvious choice because it's at night. I don't want to be driving at night if I can avoid it, especially tired. But there's a gray zone like an hour and a half away. And it was hard not to, it was hard not to go to it. But asking around, looking around, checking the map, there's no place to go, right? It's gray for a reason. The roads are sparse. There's no, you're in, you're always in a valley. I didn't really have time to get in proper contact with the Adirondack Astronomy Club to find out where they go and what they're doing. COVID makes everything even harder to figure out. They're like, I'll just stay where I am. Hop onto Google Earth, right? I camp here. What do I have? Well, there's a beach that overlooks the lake. Perfect. All the camp lights and you know campfires will be north of me. It's just lake and preserve to the south. Fantastic. Problem, though that beach is only accessible by those campers. Didn't find that until I got there. So quickly planning again. Here, this white star, is there's a little beach that sort of juts out into this sort of marshy body of water here. It's sand. And again, looking south over water, like south is this preserve. It's There's nothing here except frogs. Great. It's by a road. There's a parking lot. I don't have to schlep. Fantastic. Except for the night fishermen with their headlights on the entire night. Now, I was able to get south of them to the very tip of the beach. They were polite and sort of turned the, their car headlights away from me. It was fine for the photography, but wasn't great for the observing because you just, your light pollution just never, your, yeah, light pollution, your dark adaption never comes back. Poked around, asked one of the camp rangers, and he said, well, we go here <laughs> when it's dark and when it's clear. And this is a more or less a service road that leads to some old train tracks and then a causeway into the marsh. 
and you can drive as far as that, you can drive as far as here, and then you walk past some trees, and then there's an opening onto this flat marshland, and you're in the marshland, and you're more than covered. So did that the second night. Now, three days before trip, I, what do I bring? Right, well, I borrowed everything from a friend. I borrowed the binoculars. I borrowed the, the camera lens that went with the camera I had just recently got. I borrowed the tracker and the tripod. Right? It's nice to have friends with good taste and gear. And just on a whim, this is the shot from where they were night fishing. Right? This is, I mean, obviously processed to be more than what it looked like, but all of this was sort of visible. This dark streak was definitely visible. This is Jupiter and Saturn. And you can see the light pollution that was to the south, but it's reasonably covered by the mountain. And the lake and the water, nice, steady. Fantastic. The next night was even better. Now, mind the fact that this image was processed for a completely different aesthetic. So just bear with the oranginess, yellow sepia tone but it was surprisingly darker, <laughs> just a little bit away. It's amazing what a, um, what a bit of a trip can do. And you, know, you can see the causeway and the grassland. And here, actually, the, the mountain blocked that light dome a little bit better because I was from a slightly different perspective. And these are just single shots, by the way. This is just a single shot of just over the lake on the tripod, 10 seconds, F1.7, ISO 6400. Process, nothing crazy. If you were tracking, you do a little better. This was about 10 minutes worth of exposure overall. You'll see I'm pointing fairly vertical, which I don't know if you notice, do. There's a little haze around that star, it dude over, right? I didn't realize the lens, the, the uh, lens filter dude over. Right, so even through the do, this is what you get with 10 minutes. Right? Like this is not hours and hours of setup and hours of exposure time and chugging through and then hours of processing. This is a 10 minute exposure. And with the gear, with the tripod, the tracker, the camera, it's a five minute setup. Right? And it's even even quicker breakdown because you just throw it in the back seat of the car. Bring a lawn chair, you have a great time. You want to spend a little bit longer, you can go for a half hour. Right? And the longer you can actually expose your image for, the better you'll get, but there's diminishing returns. Right? So after a half hour, I wouldn't have gotten much more detail than I did in here. You know, if I did an hour, it would have looked about the same. Right? And for comparison, can you tell me which one is 10 minutes and which one's half an hour? it's kind of hard to tell, right? If I hadn't already told you the little hints about the halo around that star, I bet you most people would have not been able to, to peg them apart. And if you don't have a tracker and you do want to do something more than a single shot, right? You don't want to bring anything extensive. Time lapses. And I'll leave you here these repeating time lapses. One for each night, about 20-ish eh, or so minutes total, taking a 10-second exposure, waiting 10 seconds, taking another 10-second exposure. You see planes, shooting stars, the galaxy just rotating around you. It's quiet. It's dark. It's peaceful. That was the balance. I wanted, that may not be the balance you want, but what's great is you can tailor it to exactly what you need and what you want. So with that, I will say, thank you very much. And I guess we can open it up for questions now. Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, go ahead, Mary. Uh I was just going to say, thank you, Aaron. Yes. Does anybody have any questions for Aaron? There's the Q&A pane at the bottom of your screen. I see no open questions. 
Oh, well, there are questions submitted okay. by an anonymous user named George. <laughs> Do yachts have the same regulations requiring lighting as the cruise ships do? Out to sea, yes. I believe that any ship out in an open channel is required by law to have their running lights on. I could be wrong, I'm not a mariner, but I have never seen a ship out to sea that didn't have running lights on. In a bay, in a cove, small private boat, that's a different story. You know, if you're totally by yourself and you just don't want to have the lights on, and it's a private, it's a private yacht. Who's going to know, right? Unless you, get, <laughs> unless the Coast Guard happens to come by, or the CIA phones it in because you know they lost you on the spy satellite, or you crash. And the other ship was like, "Well, they didn't have the lights on. Like I should have seen them." You'll be perfectly fine. Okay. Uh, question from Cliff: How is polar alignment with the tracker? Damn good. I will say, damn good. So the there's a little hole you look through, and it's just a straight through hole. And that's what I used. And with, I didn't go for longer exposures on the tracking images than I did for the time lapse still shots. I kept the exposures the same because I knew I wasn't staying out long. I knew the dew was coming. I didn't want to waste that five minutes or so fiddling with, well, how much can I get away with before the stars trail? And how much, you know, can I go for 20 seconds? Can I go for 22 seconds? How much can, no, I was just like, it's fine. I'll just take more pictures. It's fine. So for 10 seconds at 24 millimeters pointing above just north of, you know, just above in declination from Sagittarius, those, that 10 second exposure was perfect. The stars were perfectly round, well within the capabilities of the, of the camera lens to resolve on that camera, which by the way, Sony a7R2, if anybody's just curious. There is, however, a polar scope that mounts right through the axis. So where you mount the ball head to mount the camera actually comes off. And the polar scope goes through that. So you're actually polar aligning directly on the axis of rotation. And that's far more precise. This particular tracker is designed for, you know, small telescopes, telephoto lenses. You know, the five, it comes with a counterweight bar. You can, you know, you can add extra counterweights. You can go for, you can go crazy. It'll be fine. There are other, I mean, other models are available from other manufacturers. There are even companies that make tiny little, tiny little, like normal mounts, like normal, normal general, general German equatorial mounts, but just tiny. Um, but they require separate power and what have you. And uh, there's another one that looks weird that has like a tangent arm that comes out. You know, they, they boast, you know, higher weight capacities, but you only, with that particular one, you only have the limit of how much time you have for that tangent arm to go out before you're stuck. And then you have to bring it back and you can, you know, this thing just will spin in circles for days. And I do mean days, the batteries just, it, it, it's amazing how little the batteries drain. Great. All right. So, Aaron, we have a couple other questions. Uh, we have yeah. a question by Alan. Yep, I, I can see it. In the Everglades, were you bothered by night critters in the swamp? Oh, my God, you have no idea. It was July in the Everglades. <clears throat> the ranger thought I was crazy for, like, staying out at night. I, I will tell you this. It was so bad with the mosquitoes, I learned how to use binoculars while walking. Because the tiny mosquitoes were slow enough that I could walk faster than they could catch me. So I just walked up and down the boardwalk all night. Um, but my hands got eaten up anytime I stopped to adjust the camera or whatever. So yeah, there were plenty of night critters and it was awful go in November. Um, how much was were the Canon Im image stabilized binoculars? So those are Tony's. Um, so they cost me zero. But um, at B&H, I think they're 1100 bucks. Used, there's a, uh, I think they're around 900 at this point. Uh, running lights, but deck lights are not required. Thanks, Mark. Oh, that's cool. So Cliff is saying that on a Carnival Cruise to Aruba, the captain turned off the lights on the bow and let them hang out out there. That is just fantastic. And you are luckier than most to have a captain who was um, willing to do that. The ship I was on did not, I asked. 
All right. Any other questions? I don't see any. We've got a couple of comments in the chat room. Sure. Uh, Charlie Rule says, very interesting talk. Oh, thank you, Charlie. And uh, another anonymous user named George posted, I love mango. Then you have got to go there. <laughs> I swear. You just, they let you eat whatever falls to the ground, which I know sounds kind of gross, but it's not. Like, because you know when it falls. Oh, no, yeah, falls, it's not. It was ripe. I've and eaten it, mango on the ground and it's the best thing ever. There, there, were, there were mangoes you had to drink. You, oh, they, my goodness. The blacker they are, the better they are. <laughs> it, was just, it, was just, it was just astounding. And that's not yeah. even the biggest collection of mangoes. The biggest collection of mangoes in Southern Florida is at the Fairchild Botanical Gardens at their Mango Research Center. They have 800 varieties, but they don't let you eat them. Oh, but they're there. Nice. Yeah, I've, I've, I've had the, the privilege of uh, being in a tropical area where we would go to the mango tree and shake it. But the best mangoes were the mangoes that were already on the ground when you got to the tree. <laughs> they, were, they, they ripened on the tree until they were ready to just fall off. And yeah, now those are the best. All right. Well, thank you very much. I hope you all enjoyed or and or learned something. So thank you. All right, Aaron, thanks very much. Um, I just want to remind everybody to join us every Friday night at 8 p.m. online. Uh, our presentation next week is Gravitational Waves, A New View of the Universe. Now, this is being presented by Dr. Amber Stuber from Villanova University. So I encourage everybody to join in. And we'll see you next time.